God is good. And all the time. Uh, again, good morning, uh, church family. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Mark Piazza. And our pastor is away today uh, uh, serving in a men's retreat. And uh, today we're uh, continuing our Offer Them Christ, our Missions Emphasis Month, with uh, Joni Smitley. Uh, she serves with Samaritan's Purse as a nurse. And uh, we're excited to hear how the Lord is working through her in that ministry. Our call to worship today comes from Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be on my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Let us pray. Father God, we just come before you, Lord, and we pray that we would just humble ourselves before you, Lord, that we would just come in awe of who you are. Father, in all that you've made us in your name by your blood. Father, I pray that you would just be enthroned in this place this morning, Father, that we would be here to exalt and praise your holy name. Father, break down the barriers that keep us from doing that. Father, I pray that you would mold us and shape us into the image of Jesus Christ in this hour, that you would work in Joni in a mighty way. Father, that we would be changed men and women and boys and girls. We would be different than the way that we walked in here. Father, that you might be magnified and your son be glorified in this hour. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Exodus 14, 1 through 4 and verse 14. The Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near pi ha heroth between Migdal and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea directly opposite of Baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and his army. And the Egyptians will know that I am Lord. So the Israelites, Israelites did this. The Lord will fight for you, and you need only to be still. The word of God for the people of God this morning. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, Finley Lake Church. I am so glad to be here. I know I say this every time, but I love coming to this church. I honestly, and I, I may have said this before too, I don't know, but um, being a preacher's wife, obviously it's kind of important that the preacher's wife goes to the church that the, your husband goes to, so I do go to my own church, of course, but I've often thought, I've told my husband a couple times, I said, you know what, if you weren't in the pastorate, I think Finley Lake Church would be a great church to go to. So, so I say that honestly. I, I feel like it's kind of like um, coming home. I don't know. I knew I grew up... Um, come in here in the summer times and, and things like that, but um, it truly is. I, I say that with a, a sincere heart. Um, I always love to come and see everybody and kind of catch up and see how you're doing and then see new faces, and so that's, that's always a blessing. Um, just want to give you a little bit of update just um, in personal life. So me and my husband, Tim, just celebrated 25 years of marriage, um, so really excited about that. Um, just the fact that um, I think anybody that survives in a marriage 25 years, there's something to be said about that, but um, being in the pastorate, too, um, he's been a pastor the same amount of time. We were engaged and then, then got married and went straight into the ministry together. And um, so it's, it's been a, a, great, a great time of that. My three kids, I have Tim, Levi, and Rachel, or Tim, Rachel, and Levi, if you want to put them in order. Um, and my oldest son, Tim, is getting married in July. Um, he's a nurse at Hammett. And then my daughter, Rachel, is getting married in two weeks. So she 
is scaring me half to death. I feel like they're so young. I feel like they get, get married so young. She's 21, but, but I don't know. Some people do, and, and she's marrying, both of them are marrying um, solid Christians in their faith, and um, so I'm excited about that. And then my youngest son, Levi, just um, a few months ago passed his state boards, and now he's also a nurse at Hammett. So just thought, you know, as I, I come here and I get to know you guys a little bit, I just thought, you know what, let me just give you a little update on things that are going on in my life, just because um, I know you guys are all brothers and sisters in the faith, and um, like to share that journey with you. So um, I still continue to work for Warren County as the nurse um, and also EMS specialist. It's kind of a dual role in anything and everything with training for your fire departments and emergency medical um, technicians and things like that. We do cross over sometimes into New York, and I do some of the trainings over here and kind of pull people in, too, to just... You always have to have so many trainings and so many hours of continuing education. So I, I keep those trainings up for them. And then also, um, again, anything disaster management. So I do that for the county. And, of course, infectious disease, that's part of that. Um, and then we also uh, have our refugee uh, population where we've brought people over from Ukraine, people that I actually knew and worked with or had really close contacts with and brought them here. We have an English class and teach them English and life skills, just getting accustomed to living in a different culture um, and just how things work in America. And, and so it started out with just Ukrainian folks, and now we have like people from Venezuela and Brazil and Colombia and, oh, I can't, I can't think of all the places, Turkey. And, and so they come and we get together on Mondays and Wednesdays and do English class, but also just kind of a support for them as well too. So that's kind of like my on the side when I'm not deployed uh, with Samaritan's Purse. So, and as I know, most of you know, and I, I know Gordon referenced this as, so I'm a nurse, or maybe it was Mark, maybe it was Mark who said this, but um, I'm a nurse with Samaritan's Purse, but also a chaplain. So I will fly in somewhere as a nurse and then come home and then I'll go back again um, as member care chaplain. So I also have that role with them and then a chaplain for the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So Samaritan's Purse also has long-term missionaries and each field then will have a field chaplain. So the DRC is, is almost the field chaplain for them. So God's been doing a lot of crazy cool things, and those are all long stories. If you want to know more about how in the world it ended up being DRC and how I ended up being a chaplain for them um, with them, I can tell you that some other time because it's kind of some cool stories how the Lord worked that out. Um, but that is not the message I feel like we have today. So the last time I was here, I believe I had just returned from one of the trips to Ukraine. Um, and then after I left here, I went back to Ukraine again. I went in multiple different times. So one of the times I was there, and I, this was the in-between. So I was here, told you about working at the train station, if any of you remember that. I'm also at our field hospital in Ukraine, told you some stories there. Also worked in Venezia, which is a town there, and Crop of Venezia. We did mobile clinics and also had a stationary clinic, and people, of course, in the war would, would come drive to us and or we would go out to different locations. Then I came here and spoke, and then when I went back um, to Ukraine, right before I was getting ready to go to, or right after I spoke here, um, I received a phone call, and it was from one of our um, folks who call people and say, hey, you know, can you go? We're, we're asking you to go to Ukraine. So I get this phone call, and the man said, Joni, we are really going into the heat of it this time. Like, so we've gone to Ukraine, people are coming to us, and then we got a little closer to the war zone, and people were still bringing people to us. Now, this time, we're going all the way into where the fighting is. And there has been um, a city that has been, taken or has been captured, and people have been in hiding in their basements and uh, have not had medical care. And if you would see on the news the different things that you might have seen when you saw, like, mass graves, um, this was those locations that I was going into, and I thought, oh my goodness, like this is crazy. Um, but I knew, and again, I'm not going to back up and tell you the whole story of the journey that God took me on because some of you already know that, but it wasn't a matter of being fearful. God took that from me on a trip clear back in Iraq way back when. Um, God removed that fear, but this time, now I was going in as the chaplain, and I had to be the spiritual leader for our team, and this was one of our, our larger responses because it takes a lot when you're in a war zone. Um, so we had about 100, I think it was like 164 um, staff working at this hospital, and I was asked to go then as that chaplain 
for our team. And, and of course, chaplain also is for the people that you go to, but very much specific, my role is to, is to minister to our own staff, to kind of keep them encouraged and prayed for and, and those types of things. And so I thought, woo, this is where the, the, the um, intimidation started creeping in. And not the fear, I wasn't afraid to go. Like I said, God had already worked in my life in that. I wasn't afraid to go. I was going wherever God had called me to go. But this time I thought, oh, I've got to be like this spiritual leader. And it wasn't even, I mean, right with the Lord, nothing like that. It, it, my whole intimidation came from who in the world am I to be that? Like, what if I get scared? Like, what if, like, if, you know, bombs are going on around us, you know, we're right there in the heat of things, you're going to be hearing things, a lot of stuff is going to be happening. And I thought, what if I start to melt down? Like, I can't do that. I've got to be this, this front to these people and not, not a false front, but, but really prayed up. And like, I have to be that person who can hold it together when who knows what's happening and who knows what is going, going to happen. And so I was just thinking, Lord, why in the world? Like, who am I that you're, you're wanting me to do this? And so I was praying, like, Lord, am I the one? And lots of confirmation and lots of, you know, being in the word and prayer and I just talking to my husband. And I feel like, you know, when I do those types of responses, it, it very much needs to be a team decision. You know, when you get married, God makes you one. So it's not just me saying, I'm going. I really needed to, to have that confirmation as well from my husband. Um, and he was 100% for it. Um, and sometimes I laugh. I'm like, you're quicker to respond to send me. I'm starting to get worried that you want me to go to these places. <laughs> But he's always like, no, Jenny, I just know that this is what God has called you to. And so I'm okay with that as hard as it is. And so um, just crying out to God, you know, who in the world am I to be the spiritual lead of this team? Like, I have to be strong for these people in the middle of chaos. And so I was reminded of, of the scripture and the story of Gideon. Um, Gideon was a farmer from the tribe of Manasseh. And, it, and if you remember the story in Judges 6, um, God called Gideon to lead the Israelites after they had suffered seven years under the oppression of the Midian, Midianites. Um, Gideon was reluctant to go. And so I'm going to read Judges 6, uh, 12, through, 12 through 16. So Judges 6, 12 through 16. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Why are all his wonders that our, that our ancestors, where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied again, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my family. And the Lord answered, I will be with you and will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. And I thought when I was, was praying those prayers, I thought, okay, Lord, here I am. Uh, like, I wasn't a farmer, but like the least tribe, the least, you know, youngest in my family, like there is no way. Like, how in the world are you calling me to do this? And am I up for it? And so just the this, this struggle of praying through that, um, and, and if you follow the rest of the story, um, Gideon indeed does go, and he has that conversation with the Lord. And then chapter or verse 28 says, Thus Midian was subdued before the Israelites and did not raise its head again. During Gideon's lifetime, the land had peace for 40 years. So with 300 people, as the story goes, with 300 people, he conquered this vast army of Midianites in the, in the name of the Lord because the Lord had called, them, called him. So just sharing like the real struggle of like what God does when he starts to call and, and thinking, okay, this is crazy enough anyway, going to a war zone, but now to have to be in front of this group and keeping it together. And I just thought, I can't believe, Lord, you're calling me to this. So, and I'll, I'll get a little bit more into that. So then, so we, I fly into Ukraine and you fly into, actually fly into Poland because there's no fly zone in Ukraine, fly into Poland and then you drive the long journey and I had to go all the way to the east and so we called the place K-9. Um, that was just a, a descriptive place because we couldn't say where we were going and I honestly didn't know where, what town exactly I was going at the time. Uh, when they called, they said, we're going all the way into the heat of the battle um, but we can't tell you where, obviously, because you can't be saying that over the phone and, and, you know, contacting through emails. You can't do that. 
So when I would get to Poland, they would give us more of the, the description of what it would look like. I kind of had in my mind a guess of, guess of where we were going, um, but I didn't know. So we land in Poland, get in a van right across the border, and then like 17 hours all the way into, into where we were going. Um, the ride in, our drivers, we had a van going in. Um, our driver was told to, to drive as fast, safely as he could because you've got to get out of there as you're, you're driving. You can't be you know, just stuck along the road. Do not stop for any reason. There's, there's landmines. There's all kinds of things. You can't step out. So it doesn't matter. You're going 17 hours. You take you know, water and you take sandwich or food with you, um, just enough for the trip, and you book it to where you're going. Um, so then we set up in a town, and when we pulled into where this, or a city, we pulled into the city, and to get into the city, there was only one, one bridge that was um, operating. All the other bridges had been, had blown apart, um, destroyed, and there was one little pontoon bridge, so it was kind of a makeshift bridge just to be able to get us, uh, get us through and to get the army to go through. And so drive across that, that little pontoon bridge, um, and that was a little bit, little bit nerve-wracking. Um, and I remember as we were driving, just passing the mass graves where, where the Russian armies had just thrown the people into these, these graves and how, how horribly sad that was. Um, the bombed-out buildings, um, things that you just you can't even comprehend what you're seeing, the, the magnitude of what that looked like. Um, so then I remember in the location we were at, if you just look across the, like just beside the building where we set up as a hospital, um, there was a playground. And I just remember, you know, no children playing a beautiful playground, little monuments and all kinds of pretty walkways and brick, brick walkways and nobody played. You know, nobody could even be in there because of all the landmines and hidden ordinances or unexploded ordinances. Um, so... I know when we got there, we set up in, it was, a, it was supposed to be for like a little mall, like a three-tier mall, and because of the city being, being bombed out, obviously, you know, because of the war, this now was not a plan to be used as that because there was nothing really left in the city. And so this building, for some reason, was the only building really that we could find that would meet our needs that was still pretty safe, safe enough standing. Um, and so we set up in this hospital, or not hospital, this mall, and made it into a hospital. And so you'd have to go up the three flights of stairs between the different floors of your hospital. The bottom, of course, was your triage, your emergency room, bringing them in. And then the next two floors, the second floor then would be like for the hospital rooms. And then the top floor would be where we would eat and have those types of things, play games or whatever, if there were time. Um, so we set up in this place and we weren't allowed to go outside. So once you're in, you're not allowed to go outside. Again, because there's landmines all around, there's, there's unexploded ordinances you don't want to step on, um, so you have to be really careful. So you stay inside, but we also had a front porch, just a little um, cement block porch, and you could go on that a couple feet out, so you come out the doors and then onto this porch, and then there was all these sandbags that were just piled up high. So really you could just see out above it so that you could kind of duck down and kind of have a little bit of safety. Um, so we would go out there for fresh air, and then sometimes we would go onto the rooftops when it was safe. Certain times you couldn't, certain times you could. We would go onto the rooftops, and we would stand up there, and you could just watch the battle going on. And seeing, like, the trees blown apart and just really nothing to it, you know, no leaves, just you know, wooden skeletons of trees, and um, you would watch the flares go up, and then you would see the bombs, and just the, the crazy of it, and so we would stand on that rooftop, and, and just, the, just the heartbreak, looking over that city, and thinking, what in the world, like, this is unbelievable, what these people are going through, so our patients that started coming to us, we would start to help be able to get them to our hospital. The, once they found out, okay, there's a hospital here, they would try to get out and make it there. Um, so there was people with like gangrene because they had wounds that hadn't been treated because there was no help and they couldn't get out. Um, of course, people with diabetes and, and medications that they needed and weren't able to get to, so very sick, acutely ill people. Um, we had people who had a lot of frostbite from hiding in their bunkers in the basement of their houses. For, for many months, no water. This place has no water, still has no water. Um, very little food. Uh, so, you know, we're treating these needs. And then, of course, uh, soldiers would come, too. 
And I remember when, and we treat, we treat anybody, but we only, in this particular location, only had Ukrainian soldiers that would show up. And I remember soldiers coming in and, and they would say, oh, I have this headache or I have this stomach ache. And, and when the doctors would examine them, really there was, there was nothing wrong with them. And so I remember, you know, one of the staff saying, oh, we have these people coming. There's really nothing wrong with them. And, and I remember just stopping and saying, you know what, if this can be a refuge for three hours for these soldiers, let's give it to them. Like they've got three hours and we're sending these people back out. Let's, in that amount of time, give them all the love that we can, you know, like let Christ just pour through us onto these people. And I remember as I was, I was getting ready to go to Ukraine, somebody, my sister actually, sent me a box of um, hand warmers. Um, you know, like when you're going hunting or whatever, you've got those little hand warmer packages. They're each about like that big. And she sent me with a bunch of those. And so I started to, there was one lady sitting in line getting ready to, to be seen, and she was just kind of freezing. And so I got one of those hand warmers and started to get it activated where it starts to heat up. And I, I slipped it in her hand and she just looked at me. Her eyes got real big, like, what in the world is this? Like people, I don't know, nobody there had ever even seen a hand warmer. It was like this most amazing thing to him. And so putting it in her, just her little hand as she's sitting there. And then as soldiers would come, I would give them some and for the extra, you know, um, like give them a few extra. So when they were going back out, they would just have a little bit of comfort or a little bit of warmth for a moment. And so when my sister sent me these, these hand warmers, I packed them in my bag. I had 50 of them, packed them in my suitcase, and took them, and, and I, I um, would run downstairs. So, okay, so we had the three-tier hospital, the top floor, second floor, first floor. Then in the basement is where actually where we slept. So then in the basement, because you have night shift nurses, you have day shift nurses, you always had the lights off so you were not waking anybody. So you would have to creep in and get your stuff with like a flashlight. And so I would go down when I would run out of hand warmers and I would just kind of feel on my suitcase for like where that package or where that zipper was and then start to pull out hand warmers. Well, after about 40 times of giving these, I thought I've got to be running out, but it was dark, so I didn't know. And so I went down and in the dark, my flashlight, and I'm trying to count, and it felt like there was so much more. I'm like, I've had to have given out 40 of these already. Like, I should be running out. Like, there was only 50 that I was sent with. And I continued to do this over and over, and I'm like, I'm just, I am not second guessing this. I'm like, let's just bring it on because I don't know, but I'm not running out. And so I'm hitting, and I'm thinking, there's a lot of hand warmers. Where are these coming from? And I remember, um, and, and I'm going to tell you the second part of that story, but I just remember thinking, okay, I'm not even going to question it. Why question it? I'm just going to, okay, Lord, I'm leaving this with you. And so um, the hand warmers became this thing there. Uh, one of our patients uh, that came in, he, they're, they're mushroom hunters. They like to look for mushrooms and foragers. And so they were a couple kids and um, a young man. They were three different stories, so two kids and a man. Um, were foraging mushrooms and came upon landmines and lost limbs. And so those were some of our patients. And then uh, we had a patient who came in and he was injured from the war, um, had just really shattered his leg, and so he had to have surgery. And so and he was just angry at the world, just as mad as can be. I mean, he went through a lot, I mean, a lot of trauma. Um, and alcohol was very, you know, prevalent with him. He was very alcoholic, um, just from, you know, the pain he was suffering and things like that. And so we started taking care of this man and just, again, mad at the world, like I said. And we would go in and talk with him and, you know, do you want to play games? And we'd play games with him. And it's just still just this, his countenance was just very closed. And um, we would sing. And I mean, I love to like just go in and sing with patients and um, just kind of provide that comfort that way. And, um, we would go in and, and offer to pray with him. And he was always like, okay, you know, pray, sure. You know, it's okay to pray for me. And so we would do that day in and day out and day in and day out and just love on this young, on this young man. And we started to see, like, where he would start to smile, just a little bit of a glimmer of hope, like, once in a while. Like, he'd get this little grin or a little bit of a smile. And then eventually he started asking questions, like, what in the world is going on? Like, you know, you guys are always happy and we know you're tired we know you're stressed you know this is crazy but you guys are always smiling you're you're giving even when it's hard and you're just like really catering to me and it just really ministered to him 
to the point where then he did pray and accept the Lord in his heart. And the change of his countenance was incredible. You know, when Jesus does that work in us, like your circumstances don't always change. Sometimes they do because it's choice, but other times your circumstances don't even change. But that inward dwelling of the life-giving hope that Jesus is, that water that never ends, that we never thirst, changes people's lives. And to see his countenance change. So then he started singing with us, and then he would walk with crutches. We got him up and doing that, and then it was a time where we were ready to discharge him. And all of us were just like, oh, you know, we've worked so much with him and loved on him. And to see him go was, was hard. Well, about a few weeks later, he came back, and here he brought all his family because he wanted everybody to meet him. And the, the encouragement that his mom's heart had as well, his mom just thanked us profusely. And again, we're saying, look, this is the Lord. We had nothing to do. Like, this is the Lord who's done this work in him. But be able then to witness to his whole family and just that countenance, that change on that young man's life. You know, those are just stories of, of the things that we are doing. Um, one of the days when we went out onto the porch to get fresh air, um, we're standing there and looking over the, um, the sandbags. And so you're looking at the street. So you come out on the porch, sandbags, and then there's a street right there, and all the buildings are bombed. And it's just, it's a mess. And so I see this a group of us are standing on the porch, and I see a man and a little boy walking, come in, getting closer and closer, and the little boy is carrying something under his arms, and, and they get closer and right before us, and here they have an Operation Christmas Child shoebox. You know how you do the shoeboxes at Christmas? They, he had one of these tucked under his, under his arm, had no idea, like, this is the place it came from, like, like Salvation, or Salvation, yeah, Salvation Army. I used to work for them, too. They're a good place. Um, Samaritan's Purse, like, this is the hospital, because you can't announce that, because we're hidden. We don't want, you know, Russia to know we're there doing this. Um, and so we're hidden, and so this little guy had no idea that these are the very people, and I thought, you know, how encouraging like that, and I wanted to share that with you, because I know that's something that, that many of you do is the shoeboxes, to know, like, that's legit. Like, these people get it. And it, it comes back full circle, and it encourages us, too, to see this little guy who lost everything. So here he is in a war zone with everything around him shattered and laid low and gone and everything he knows, and now he has this hope. And it's not just toys. It's that hope of Jesus that Christians have poured into this little guy's life. So to see that was, we just stood there in, like, disbelief. Like, can you believe this is happening? Like, here's this kid in the middle of nowhere, like, you know, this war scene. And he's carrying that little, that little gift of hope that was huge to him. Um, so every morning at, at about 6, well, it's, we try to do it at 6.45, 7 a.m., um, I'll do devotions with the staff. And so everybody will come in. We'll do announcements, all those types of things. And we'll sing a few songs. We usually have a worship leader. Um, and then I'll do the devotions. Or sometimes I'll, you know, people will take turns. I'll sign people up. Um, and I remember doing devotions day in and day out with these people, you know, 164 of our staff. And then we started to have our interpreters kind of sitting in. And they, they would want to hear. And, and, and again, they became a part of that as well. And I remember just... Being able to, and again, like stand up before these people and thinking, you know, again, who am I to like deliver these messages, <laughs> like to the from the Lord to these people, and just standing there and like just their hearts and the receptiveness they had and pouring into them. And and I remember one day the the tanks were especially close, and there was you know the Russians had made a, a real big push closer to us, and so very close at this point. Um, we were always close, like 18 kilometers. I don't even remember what that is now, if there's a translation of what that is in, in miles, but very close. And now they were even closer. Um, and so I remember there was just a little bit of edginess, you know, among the staff and just a little woo. And I remember years and years ago serving on the mission field, um, on the American Indian field. And I remember the Lord wanting me to memorize this scripture about some trust in chariots, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. And it was out of Psalms. And I remember years and years ago, like God wanting me to do it, it was Psalms 27 and 8. And the Lord just wanted me to memorize that chapter, and I felt so impressed in my heart, but it never made sense for years and years and years and years. I knew, like, so I memorized this chapter, and lo and behold, that day, I don't know, 25 years later, after the Lord putting that on my heart and never knowing why specific that, specifically that scripture he wanted me to memorize, that morning this scripture came to to mind, and it was some trust in chariots and horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. And so I paraphrased it that morning and told them that, you know, obviously that's what I was doing. But I said, 
Some, pointing like to the Russian armies, you know, some trust in tanks, SU-27 planes and artillery, but we here will trust in the Lord our God. You know, those things can look frightening, but it is no match for what the Lord is and his amazing, amazingness and what he can help us with. And so then we had this time of worship, and it was just an incredible time. You know, if you're in a war zone and you're standing there worshiping and you're all committed to serving the Lord, knowing that, you know, you may not have tomorrow, you may not have the next hour, I can't tell you the resolve that that worship time is. It's like an incredible, <laughs> incredible experience of what the Lord does, and it's like this sincere heart of worship. Um, so through that time and, and the uncertainties of like, Lord, who in the world am I? And again, I don't share this with anything I am because I'm not anything. That, that's the whole point. I am nobody, just willing. And why God chooses me sometimes, I don't understand. Um, but the staff would come to me and we would talk and we would go late into the night or I'd encourage or write them scripture verses and I would give them each a note at different times throughout the time we were there and write their names out in Ukrainian just for something for them to remember, just pouring into our staff and loving them on it, loving them through that and just the receptiveness and how the Lord worked and the hearts that even in our own staff that were changed um, and motivated for the love of God and and God kept me strong <laughs> even in the midst of that. I never, again, didn't have fear. And I was able to stand before because it wasn't me standing before the people. You know, it was God literally saying, here's a message for you, you know, to the people. And it was received so well. And to this, you know, even to this day now, that group of people, we still have a chat group together um, that we share prayer requests. And it's continued on. And I thought, again, you know, like, who am I, Lord? Like, but he knew. He gives us the strength when he calls us to do something. Um, and I'm just going to check my time because I don't want to talk forever for you guys, but I want to make sure I know where I'm at on time. Um, what time do you usually get out? Like 10 minutes ago? <laughs> okay, perfect. Okay. Um, so then most recently I was in, in Turkey um, as far as overseas. Uh, we had that massive earthquake, if any of you remember maybe seeing in that. And it was one earthquake and then another massive earthquake and then many earthquakes after and, and everything was just laid level in a place called Antakya. Antakya is actually Antioch. So if you think of um, Paul and Barnabas, they went to Antioch. That was the first church. Um, first church in, in all of our, you know, our background as, as Christians. The first time we were ever called Christians was in the town of Antioch, and that's where we're going in Turkey. Turkey, if you're familiar with anything with persecuted church, um, is a place that absolutely bans Christianity, is very hostile to it. Um, and so we were going in Turkey to allow us to go in. At first, they were absolutely not, you know, we're not having Christians in here. Like, what are you talking about? But the need was so great that the Turkey government finally said, okay, you can come. You have these stipulations. You cannot cannot mention the name of Jesus. You can't talk about God. We don't even want you singing because we don't know what you're saying when you're singing. So we don't even, so don't even be singing when you're going. Like huge stipulations to go. And, and Samaritan's Purse was like, you know, this is, this is a tough thing. We go in the name of Jesus. Um, what, what does this look like? But we knew that there were Christians in that area that we were going. Um, and we also didn't want to become a risk to them as well. So they had been there for years and years doing, you know, heartfelt work with these people. So we didn't want to put them at risk either. So we agreed to go, knowing, like, this was our stipulation. Um, and if anybody knows me, I mean, I know God has called me to hard things. I know he's called me to the places that are persecuted. Um, I just know that that's something that God has put in my heart. So to not say any of that, I was like, there is no way that can happen, like, so I started praying, like, Lord, what does this look like? And, and everybody was struggling with that because this is, you know, this is what we do. This is who we go in. You know, how can you not offer that life-giving hope? How can you not give that when that is the essence of, yes, we want to stop human suffering physically. Of course, we don't want nobody in pain. That's why we do this. But that is also an avenue to really give them that life-giving hope that is eventually, you know, eternity in heaven um, and then the hope on earth with God. And so, you know, there's a lot of people struggling with that and, and coming in like, Johnny, how can we not? Like, like, this is killing us. Like, this isn't, this just doesn't, it was just this mind game, like, you know, in a heart game and in our souls. And, and so I just started praying, you know, I was like, Lord, help me guide this team. Like, what does this even look like? Like, Lord, how, how does this work? 
And I remembered the scriptures of Moses, where Moses had gone on to the mount, and he was up on the mountain for 40 days. And this is where God had written the, the two tablets, the stone tablets with the um, Ten Commandments and the things that God wanted the people of Israel to do. And so Moses was up there for 40 days. And, and it said when he, comes, when he came down off the mountain, the people seen him coming, and he was glowing. And the people were so afraid. They were like, "Woo! you know, what is happening? He's glowing. He, and he was in the presence of the Almighty God, and they knew it because his countenance was glowing. And so they were afraid. And then I thought, you know, in that scripture, the Lord reminded me, it doesn't have to be your mouth that we use, that I use. It doesn't always have to be that. Yeah, that's a huge tool, and that it's a big, big thing. But I can work supernaturally. But what that takes is being in my presence, getting before me, being before me, you know, reading your Bible, asking, asking me to come in in that situation. So I shared that, that scripture with our staff. We were allowed to do our own devotions very privately. It had to be very quiet. Um, and so I shared that with the staff, and I thought, you know what? Let's just stand back and watch how the Lord is going to work. And so without ever speaking, you know, a word, um, our staff, who, again, you have Turkish staff coming in, so our international staff at this point to help interpret and, and you know, all the things that it takes to run a field hospital, we hire the Turkish people. The staff started asking questions like, what is this joy that you guys have? And then, I, like, this was happening. All these different people were coming in and asking us questions, all these, you know, patients as well as the people we had hired. And I remember sitting down at lunch one day and a young man, oh, I don't know, in his 20s, came and sat down across from me, who's one of our interpreters, and, and he started asking me questions like, what is going on with you guys? Like, you guys are different. So I started to share a little bit and, again, you know, just praying and said, well, you know, Samaritan's Purse, of course you know that, and um, talking with him and just asking the Lord to guide. So day in then and day out for, for several days, he'd come and sit down and start asking me more questions. And he was, he was getting up to the point where he's like, he didn't say this yet. He said, I know you're Christians. <laughs> like, and I know this is like a different God. And, um, but the last day we were getting ready to leave and there was a group of us, like nine of us that were going to be staying, but about 150 were going to be leaving because um, we were politely asked now to, to leave because we had done what we could, I guess, and they were wanting us to leave. So... Um, he comes in and we had a celebration for all the staff, you know, thank you for helping us and, you know, loving on them. And, and mind you, things were going on with several people. This is one small story. Everybody was getting this, but he comes up to me and, and we're standing there and we, on our hospital, we do like have the circle. If you've ever seen the Samaritan's Purse emblem, it's a circle, kind of looks like a half globe. And then in the, in the center is a symbol, kind of like of a cross, kind of like this. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but um, and we were standing beside that. It was on the side of our hospital tent. And, and he was like um, talking to me about how all through these days, how I'd been sharing with him and how he was feeling like this joy starting to take place. He said, I just want you to know, he said, my family is like devout Muslim. He said, I am atheist. He said, I actually pulled away from even Muslim and my family is incredibly Muslim, like devout. He said, but watching you guys and seeing what's been happening, he said, I just want you to know, I know who you serve. He said, and I just want you to know it's made a difference in my life. And he pointed to the cross and he said, this symbol right here, and he outlined it with his finger. He said, this symbol is for everybody. He said, and I want you to know that I'm going to take that symbol he said, well, not that symbol, but he said, I'm going to take that symbol with me. He said, because we all, and he pointed to all the other Turkish people helping, he said, we all have been talking, and every one of us know the God you serve is Jesus. And I want that. So even in the hard where you're thinking, like, and, and I don't know, I still, I still struggle and still have a little bit, I, I work through with that, like, woo, how can you go and not, you know, how can you? But it also showed me that we can't limit God. We can't put him in that box. God is able. And to this day, I keep in contact with this young man, and he is still going strong for the Lord. 
and still will reference, I still can't believe the joy that you have, like just what God does. So I want to share and close this with you, pull this out for you and break it down a little bit of what, what I feel like the Lord's put on my heart for you guys this morning. I don't know, we have a movie, Samaritan's Purse has a movie out, uh, Facing Darkness. It's out from, been out a few years. One of our, um, when we were treating Ebola in Africa, one of our doctors came down with Ebola and one of our nurses um, needed to fly him back to the States. This was when President Obama was in. President Obama said, absolutely not, you're bring, not bringing that here. And, um, you know, he said, you do, if you do, there will be no more Samaritan's Purse. Um, and so... Franklin Graham got off the phone and um, he looked at the people and he said, well, we've, after, after talking with Obama, he said, well, we've heard from man. He said, now we're going to hear from the Lord. So they, they really prayed about it, flew the guy in, flew our doctor in to have this treatment. Um, and of course, you know, the Lord protected people and, you know, nothing ever happened that way, but saved this man's life. So basically we gave him vaccines that never had been tried, tested on monkeys, all that kind of stuff. And it worked. Miraculously, it worked. And it saved his life. The nurse also, they split the vaccine in half. It was temp like it was just a in trial, like absolutely never tried on people. We didn't know if it was going to kill them or what would happen. Nonetheless, split even the vial, gave half and half to each, and it, and it helped, and both of them lived. Um, in that, when he was interviewed, and he's interviewed many times, but in the movie that we have, um, he, they're interviewing him, and he says this, and his name's Kent Brantley, so Dr. Brantley. When he was asked, was it your faith that got you through that time? And, and Dr. Brantley replied, no. He said, it was my faith that put me there. So I just want you to take that in a minute. Think of that again. They asked him, was it your faith that got you through? And he said, no, it was my faith that put me there. And he was saying it was my faith that put me into that trial. It was my faith in God who called me to go to those places. And, and today, I just want to encourage you guys, um, and, I, and I know I've said this before, but if God's calling you to do it, do it. And again, I, I am nobody. Like, absolutely not. Oh, she's brave. No, I'm really not. <laughs> like, I'm not. Like, it is literally God calling me to do it. And sometimes we hear, and, and it is true, sometimes we hear people say, or often we hear people say, um, you know, it, we have his mission field here too. So it's a mission field here. It's a mission to your ne next door neighbor. And it, it is true, absolutely true. That saying is true. It's not just missionaries who go, who evangelize. It's also a mission field here. But I almost wonder if we're now using that as an excuse in our churches to not go. Um, I like to believe that if you're not called to stay, you're called to go. And I referenced that out of Matthew 28 when, you know, very familiar scripture of, you know, you think your missions, missions conference, a very familiar scripture um, where God tells people to go into all the world and preach the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, baptizing them. And that whole scripture verse, that was the last things Jesus said on earth before he went up into heaven. And I feel like, what a message. Like, he didn't say, okay, everybody stay. He said, go. I feel like some people are waiting for that calling to go. When in reality, all of us are called to go. We better be called to stay if we're not going. So I just kind of want to challenge us today, this morning, you know, in this, in this time, to not look at what your age is. Absolutely doesn't matter. I can tell you it doesn't matter. My, my babies started going. My daughter, when she's three months old, first mission trip. All the way, people that I know that are well into their 80s still doing mission trips. So I, I, I want to I challenge that. If you're not called to stay, we all better be going in some way. You know, and that might be harsh. And you're like, oh, but I can't and this and that and whatever. If you're not called to stay, the message is clear. God says, go into all the world and preach the good news. You know, the, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And I'm telling you, my prayer this morning is that you guys ask the Lord, you know, what does he want you to do? What is it he wants you to do? And I want to give you just one, um, 
one vision that I had had, and it was, and it was a time just during, during prayer, and it's not that the Lord gives me a ton of visions, I'm not saying that, but he did this one time, and I was praying, and I pictured this white tent, and it was funny because it, like our Samaritan's purse tents are white, and I didn't even think of that when that happened, and I walk into this tent, and Jesus is in there, and Jesus is kneeling at a bedside of a patient, like on the ground, on the dirt floor, or not dirt floor, but like a I don't know, some kind of tarp kind of floor. On the floor, and he's kneeling. And when I walk through the door of that tent, he looks at me, and he does this. He says, I've been waiting for you. He said, come, help. There's work to be done. And I've thought of that so many times. And I thought, you know what? That is a lot of times where we see Jesus. We see him in those places. I don't want to miss being with Jesus. So if it's in those hard places, it's at that bedside in the crazy, I want to be there because that's where my Jesus is. I mean, he's in my heart. He's here. He's here with us today. I love worshiping him with you guys. I always feel the presence of the Lord here. Good job. Good job loving him. Good job loving the Lord and making him welcome. I feel that. But I want you to keep that picture before you because Christ is also calling to you, come, there's work to be done get started, jump in. I need help. There's work to be done. So I I ask you to really to to think of that as as we close this morning. And I just want to (coughs) pray. Excuse me. I just want to pray over you guys and just hope you hear my heart this morning. Um, You know, there's there's a lot that, that could be said and so many more things. But my heart for you this morning is, again, Don't miss what God has for you. Don't let something creep in the way. Keep going. Keep that vision of Christ before you. Look up. Focus on him. It's not always our faith that gets us through. It does, for sure. But sometimes it's our faith in Christ that puts us in those hard places. But it is well worth it. So let me just pray and and ask God to just speak to us this morning. So. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for this time. I thank you for this body of believers. And Lord, I just pray right now that you would move through my heart and that you would move through the seats and the aisles of this church, God, and that you would walk in between and amongst us, Lord, and that you would speak into each of our our hearts, our ears, what it is specifically you want each one of us to do. Lord, I pray for your guidance. Pray for your discernment in situations. Pray for your healing touch. But Lord, I pray that you'd be glorified in each of our lives. I pray that not a single person in this room today would not completely surrender. I pray that they give every ounce of their heart to you, Lord. And when you call, knowing that, yeah, sometimes it's It's those crazy places, Lord. But God, you are always faithful. You're already there. You don't leave us. You don't forsake us. You give us strength in the moment. Help us to trust you. God, you are who you say you are. Help us to believe and to act upon it. Help us to be people of action, not just talk. God, I pray miracles through these believers in this particular church. I pray miracles to go forth because of their love for you, their trust in you, their obedience to you, God, and your love for them flowing through them strongly. God, I praise you this morning, and I'll always praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.